Good evening, church family. I am Dave Young. I've been young all my life, and uh, I am glad to be with all of you tonight. Y'all look good tonight. I preached a few days ago in a church, and everybody kept their mask on, and uh, I, uh, I, 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 I kind of offended the people. I said, you know, y'all look better. <laughs> and and uh, there is some truth that I looked better at Cracker Barrel. Brother Ryan would have to admit that. But I'm so delighted to be with you guys tonight. Wonderful always to serve the Lord, and I'm glad to be back in Michigan. You know I've preached more meetings in Michigan and Alabama than any other states. Isn't that incredible? Michigan and Alabama, my top two. And someone did tell me that Michigan is the northernmost southern state. And uh, there is some truth to that. This place reminds me a little bit of home, and I grew up in Tennessee. But uh, what a joy to be with you guys and to serve you. I'm sorry pastor's not here. I I always miss him. One of my favorite parts of coming here is to be around your pastor, but uh, he's on vacation, and I'm sorry about that. I really, really appreciate him. I pray for him faithfully, and I'm so thankful for him and his wife and family. But your staff did an incredible job tonight, didn't they? And uh, wonderful music. I would have come for the music, wouldn't you? The music was wonderful, and uh, I enjoyed so much. Uh, I'm so thankful for young men like your young staff that are serving the Lord. Isn't that encouraging? You're, you're finding a blessing by that, aren't you? Uh, God's not done with our land. God's raising up a new generation of young people. And I'm thrilled about that, and your staff is proof of that. What a joy, joy to serve you. I bring you greetings from my girlfriend, my favorite person in all the world, my sweetheart, my wife. We're celebrating 27 years of marriage in two weeks. And uh, I'm so thankful that she's in my life. And it's been a full day for us. My mother-in-law has bone cancer, lives in Ohio. And uh, my father-in-law's in heaven already, so she's a widow. And uh, she's been doing pretty well, but it's obvious that things are slowing down and uh, the cancer is taking its toll on her life. So we had a serious meeting this morning with a lawyer just going through things and lining things up and all. And uh, somewhat of a, of a heavy day and a busy day and a full day. Then I drove up here and I'm, I'm just so honored to serve you guys. Always a privilege to be part of your summers. And a thank you for all the times you've welcomed me. Uh, I got to say congratulations to Dylan. Isn't that awesome? The man has a baby. God didn't answer my prayers, though. I was praying for twins. And uh, <laughs> but I'm so thrilled for them. That's, exact, that's just absolutely exciting and always, always exciting. A friend of mine had a baby a few years ago. And uh, about six weeks into that baby being in his life, he said to me in a revival, he said, I haven't slept in six weeks. And I said, I have the gift of encouragement. <clears throat> and so I said, you hang in there. You hang in there. That baby will move out in about 18 years. It'll get better. <laughs> and uh, so Dylan, if it gets rough, just 18 or 19 years, about all you got. You can hang in there and it'll get better, I'm sure. But I know you're thrilled and, and congratulations. That's absolutely awesome. Is it me or is this platform different? Have you guys changed this platform? It, uh, I was thinking, now, was this here the last time I was here? It looks good. And it all looks great. The building looks great. The ground looks great. What a, what a joy to be with you guys again. How long does this service last? My watch says that it's 725 or something like that. Are you guys normally out by 10? So uh, we got plenty of time, I guess. And uh, I won't be long. You did hear about that one preacher, didn't you? He wasn't a very good preacher, but he made a very important discovery. In fact, he was a lousy preacher, but he made a very important discovery. The shorter you are, the better it is. And so if you're a lousy preacher, be short. That'll help you, won't it? Because people will love you if you're short, even if you're lousy. Am I right or wrong? That's just how we are. But God bless you for being here tonight. How's this year treated you? Has it been a, been a unique year, tough year, different year? I talked to a dear brother today. Right at 40% of their church are out of work because of this COVID. It's been a serious year, hasn't it? A startling year and a challenging year. We were home 10 weeks. We had cancellations. First time I'd been home in 10 straight weeks for 20 years. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a blessing. We embraced it. We decided, well, the Lord knew this was coming. All of our needs are met. We didn't miss any meals. And we didn't make much, but we survived and all was well. And, and we, we enjoyed being home. We just embraced it and took advantage of it. We've been back on the road for a number of weeks now. I've done revivals uh, coast to coast almost and, and on the road for the next coming weeks as well. And these are just interesting days, aren't they? Uh, how, how, do you, how, how did you handle it? Did you pray? Did you get discouraged? Did you get frustrated? Did you get down? 
I know there's a variety of ways we respond to things. I, I, I tend to at times uh, look for humor in things. I, I, I find if I can chuckle a little bit, it helps me. So I, I would look for memes that made me chuckle. I've always liked memes that make me chuckle. I, I saw one that said, Walmart is asking customers to wear masks. And then at the bottom it said, well, good luck with that. They can't even get some to wear pants. <laughs> and I thought, you know, there's a little bit of truth to that in there. And one guy posted, I think I got a tan from my refrigerator light. <laughs> and uh, there, was, there was quite a few. I, I, I did read one meme that said, I've spent two weeks hanging out all by myself, and I just want to apologize to every person I've ever spent time with. <laughs> <laughs> And one more I saw, made me chuckle a little bit, said to all my friends who say they can't wait to hug everybody, to hug everybody when this is over, I just want you to know I didn't hug you before this started and I'm not going to when it's over. <laughs> and, and so I looked for some humor. But you know what I'm finding across our land? Uh, as I go to churches, it is at an hour of, 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 of discouragement. It's an hour when, when people are down a little bit. There's some frustration. There's some uncertainty. We, we, we probably have watched too much news. I guess probably should be stricken out of that sentence, shouldn't it? It has been an unusual hour, and I want to be an encouragement to you tonight. And, and really, I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm stalling here because I'm nervous, because I'm going to preach a new sermon tonight. And I'm an evangelist. And how many of you are aware of the fact that evangelists don't do this? Uh, so uh, you should pray really hard. You should pray really hard because I'm going to preach a new sermon and that makes me really nervous. And I'm in Romans chapter 15 tonight and it's actually a sermon out of my devotional life and a message that I read. And just a thought here really helped me, encouraged me, directed me, strengthened me. And I think it will the same for you tonight. Romans 15 in your Bible and I'll be in verse 1 so that when you get there, I'll be ready uh, to read the Word of God. While you're turning, one of the things we did during COVID-19, my sweetheart and I, we've been for years wanting to start a podcast, and we did. If you've not seen our podcast, I hope you'll check it out. We call it Keeping It Young, keepingityoungpodcast.com. And if you haven't checked out our podcast, we talk about marriage, ministry, marriage, family, and ministry life. And uh, you can go on online and listen to it or any of the the uh, podcast apps, and uh, we'd love to hear what you think about it. It's our new project, and the Lord's really blessed it so far. We've been a little surprised at how, how well it's been received. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but, as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. That's a phrase that captured my attention. So I'm going to draw your attention to it again in verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. I will preach to you tonight about glorifying God in the hour we live. Okay, read it again in verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice, ye Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. In the last verse, verse 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. How many of you recognize these verses? Do you? Let's pray and ask God's help. And then I 
I want to preach to you tonight about glorifying God in this particular hour. Father, I've had a busy day, Lord, and you know that. And many of my brothers and sisters in this room have as well. There's many things in our hearts in these hours and on our minds and many things to distract us and discourage us and, and even to defeat many. And how I pray tonight that you'll take your word and you'll strengthen our hearts, you'll strengthen our faith, faith, you'll encourage us, you'll bless us, you'll help us as we read here to trust in you and to praise you and to glorify you. Use me tonight, Lord. God, I don't know the audience tonight in their entirety. And if there is a man or, or woman in the building tonight who has not yet trusted in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray you'll speak to them. You'll draw them to Christ, O oh God, and I pray they'll be saved tonight. But all of us, may all of us receive your word with gladness, apply it to our hearts, and may we be helped because of the truths of your word, I pray. In the name of our Savior Jesus, amen. You're familiar with the word glory, aren't you? To glorify God or to glorify something. You know, you, you know that phrase, don't you? Uh, the word itself means to impart glory to something or to render it excellent. It means to make renowned. It means to render illustrious. To cause the dignity and worth of some person or something to become manifest and acknowledged. It means to glorify. You could glorify a car, couldn't you? I, I, I thought for many years that the state car of Michigan is a dirty Buick. Uh, everywhere I went, you would see dusty Buicks all over Michigan. You know what I mean with that? You know what I mean with that? I always thought, there's a car, and people would feel really strongly about it, wouldn't they? They'd say, oh, you, ought to, you ought to drive a Buick. Or some people, you ought to drive a Ford. They would glorify a vehicle. I, I have a truck that I pull an RV with. We... We lived in the RV 16 years full time. Now it's about 50% of the year that we're in the RV. And I pull my fifth wheel with a truck. For years, I pulled it with a Ford. And then uh, a guy, I had an old Ford. It was a 2000 model. It uh, had the 7.3 liter diesel for you that know or even care. And it was getting old and high miles, 300 and some thousand miles. And I, uh, I blue book valued it and found out it was worth $12,000. And I had already saved 15000 towards a new truck, had it set aside. And I thought, you know, fifteen. if I could get twelve out of this truck, I could buy another truck. And the very next weekend, I was in a church in, in Iowa. And Sunday morning after the service, I, I pulled out of the parking lot in my Ford. And there was a guy standing there in the parking lot. And he waved at me. And I rolled my window down. And we fist bumped. And he said, I like this truck. What do you want for it? And I said, twenty grand. And he left and he walked off and Sunday night I came to church and he was there and he said, were you serious about selling your truck? And I said, maybe he said, well, I don't think it's worth 20,000. I thought, bummer, <laughs> that's too bad. He said, would you take 16? And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, I want. Well, I said, I can sell it to you. I got a trailer parked here behind the church and I got to get that trailer to two more revivals and back to Florida. He said, well, would you take 16 or not? And I said, well, I would. He said, all right, I'll buy it. I'll tag it. I'll insure it. I'll title it. And you can drive it, get it to Florida. I'll fly down and pick it up. So I sold him a truck. <laughs> Brother, it's yours. Unfortunately, three months later, a tornado came through and destroyed that truck. I felt badly for him, <clears throat> but I, I bought a Dodge. I, <laughs> see there, I'm telling you, people feel strongly about it. I bought a Dodge, and uh, now I drive a Dodge. A guy said to me the other day, so I'm telling you right now, I wouldn't drive a Dodge. You ought to drive a Chevy. And I said to him, fair enough, buy me one, and I will. <laughs> and, and apparently he didn't glorify Chevys as much as I thought. You, you know this word, don't you? Glorify, to make something look good, to extol it, to cause dignity and worth to that. You can do that with a spouse. How many of y'all are married tonight? Are you married? You ought, to, you ought to glorify your spouse occasionally. You ought to say, this is my sweetheart, this is my girlfriend, this is my favorite person in the world. You, you ladies ought to occasionally say, this handsome hunk of man belongs to me. And some of you ladies are thinking, that handsome hunk of man is twice the man I married. <laughs> And some of them are, aren't we, you know? The years do take a toll on us, don't they? We put on a little weight. 
But we ought to glorify our spouse. There ought to be times. I, I preach a lot this summer at camps, and I've, I've introduced my wife all summer long at camp as my girlfriend. And I had a teenager walk up to me last week, and she said, Why in the world do you call her your girlfriend? She's not your girlfriend. She's your wife. And I said, Now let me ask you a couple of reasonable questions. Is she a girl? And do you suppose she's my friend? And I won that argument. I'd make an incredible lawyer. I, I won that argument. But you know the word extol. You can extol a team. I lived 18 years <clears throat> in Ohio. I did. And I wasn't there very long until I found out that there was something going on between Michigan and Ohio. I actually several years ago preached in a church down on the border of Toledo and Ohio or, or Michigan, right there on the border. And it was Michigan, Ohio State weekend. And they had a little deal that Sunday. If you came to church in yellow and blue, they gave you a little bag of yellow and blue jelly bellies. If you showed up in red and gray, they gave you Marsha's Buckeyes. Uh, if you don't know what those are, go to, go to Cracker Barrel and you'll find them. They gave you two Marsha's Buckeyes. There was a lot of extolling of teams going on that weekend. You can extol a state. I don't know how many times I've heard somebody say, I'm from right here. Or, or right here, you know, I'm, I'm from over here. I knew I'd been in Michigan too much when someone said to one of my kids, where are you guys from in Florida? And my son said, we're from right here. <laughs> and I thought, wow, have we been in Michigan a lot, haven't we? Man, who, it works. I'm telling you right there, we're up here on the panhandle. I knew we had been here a lot. You can extol a church. Uh, Brother Ryan took me to Cracker Barrel before service tonight, and we had a meal together. And as I left Cracker Barrel, there was a young lady on the porch, and she was, you know, waiting on people and helping them to get in, an employee, her mask and her uniform. And I struck up a conversation with her for a couple of moments, asked her how she was doing. You doing all right? I mean, you getting used to wearing the mask? Has it been good? Has anybody you know been sick? And... We had just a real friendly conversation. I said to her, I said, uh, do, you, do you know anything about First Baptist Church of Bridgeport? I'm preaching there tonight. Oh, she lit up. She said, I do. When I was a little girl, I went there and I got saved. I went there and I got saved. Changed her whole spirit. She, she made your church look good. She glorified your church on the porch of a Cracker Barrel just down the road here. Now, here's what your Bible says. You got that word in your mind? The Bible says right here that the Gentiles, in verse 9, might glorify God. I want to submit to you tonight that we are to glorify God. No matter what's going on in the land, no matter what's going on in the country, no matter the discouragement, we are God's people. We are called of God to glorify Him even in the hour in which we live. And what Paul does right here is he answers the question, well, how can we do that? How can we glorify God in the situation and hour in which we live? Notice at least three truths in these first few verses of chapter 15, and our time will be God. How do you glorify God in this hour? Number one, number one, he tells us this, by focusing, by focusing on our care for one another. Isn't that what he says here in the first verse? Jumps right in. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good. I'm to build up my neighbor. He gives us the illustration of Christ in verse 3 and 4 and, and draws our attention to who God is in verse 5 and picks up this theme again in verse 6, that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By our care for each other, we can glorify God in the hour in which we live. We can't be self-focused. i got to care about you, and you got to care about me, and I've got to love you, and you've got to love me. And as a church family, we've got to be on the same page. How does he say it here? The same mind and the same mouth. We gotta be on guard lest the enemy get us so, so withdrawn and, and so uneasy and so self-focused that we don't care about each other. Unity matters in a church, doesn't it? Unity matters. I read a story somewhere along the way about a New York guy that sold his business in New York City and moved to the West and bought a ranch. And five years after he'd been there, one of his buddies from New York City came to visit him. 
And he and his buddy were talking, and his buddy said to him, What did you name the ranch? And he said, Well, I wanted to call it the Lazy Bee. My wife wanted it to be called the Bar Y. My son voted for the Susie Q, and my other son voted for the Broken Arrow. And his friend from New York said, well, what did you name it? He said, well, we just decided to give it all. We named it the Lazy B Bar Y Susie Q Broken Arrow Ranch. And his friend said, well, where's your cows? He said, we don't have any. They didn't survive the branding. I suppose there's some truth to that, wouldn't there be? I mean, how, do, how would you survive that for crying out loud? You know, in our churches, we can become so self-focused, so inward focused that we don't care about each other. When's, when's the last time, when's the last time you struck up a conversation with somebody at church for the purpose of encouraging them? The Bible says we're to, we're to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the matter of some is. The Bible, the Bible says we're to, we're to assemble together to provoke one another to love and good works. Are, are we in the habit of coming to church and sitting in our seat, going through the motions, doing what we do, discouraged or down or frustrated or, or, or maybe a little irritated about all that's happening in our world without an awareness of those around us? I was so surprised by the lady at, at Cracker Barrel. How she lit up in a conversation. Just a brief conversation. How are you? How, how is this treating you? Are you okay? I even said to her before I left, could I pray for you about anything? And she asked for prayer, and I prayed with her on the porch of Cracker Barrel. How often do you, you, you and I come to church? We sit and and we're glad to be here, and the music's great, and we pay our tithe, and we go through the motions, but we don't care about each other. And I know, I know what we, well, of course I care about others. I, I care about my brothers and sisters, but care that is not in action is really not the care it ought to be. I'm not just to say I care about you, I'm to show you that I care about you. I, I ought to pray with brothers and sisters quite frequently at church. When's the last time you prayed with a brother and sister at church because they have a need in their life? When's the last time some of you teenagers looked around the room and saw one of the widow ladies seated by herself and you went over and introduced yourself to her and you strengthened her and encouraged her? How do you glorify God in this kind of an hour? Well, here's how you glorify God. You glorify God by by focusing on our care for one another. Years ago, when I was a teenager, I, uh, I saw an older lady sitting by herself at church, and I introduced myself to her. She's in heaven now. Her name was Mrs. Sands. And, and I got to know Mrs. Sands. I never went to her house. I never had a meal with her. But every time I was in church, I conversed with Mrs. Sands. And we talked. She told me about her husband and how long he had been dead and and about what they had done and how long she had been in church and when she got saved. And I learned, I was just a teenager, just a, a young preacher boy, really. I'd not been preaching very long. I was a high school preacher boy. And I'd visit with Mrs. Sands every service. And then I went off to college to study for the ministry. I wound up at Pensacola Christian College in Pensacola, Florida, studying for the ministry. And my entire four years in Bible college, every week, I got a handwritten letter from Mrs. Sands. One page, one page, and every week she sent me somewhere between three and five one dollar bills. Every week I got a letter from Mrs. Head. I'm praying for you, Dave Young. I'm praying God will use you, that you'll learn all you can there. God will put his hand in your life. Great things will be accomplished because you're future of the ministry. And I want to have a part in it. I, I had three dollars this week. I wanted to send you three dollars. You know how I did my laundry during college? I did it because of a lady that I took the time to encourage who reciprocated the encouragement. Don't you think that may be what Paul is talking about here? We, we, we that are strong are ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Somebody you know struggling, encourage them. Don't, 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 let's not criticize. Let's not look down. Let's not, let's not find fault. Let's not, let's not belittle. Let's say, you know what? They need some love. This is a tough hour. Do you hug or not? That's a tough hour, isn't it? You know, you are, you know, I was in a church the other day, and they give out bands. You wear bands. Green means bring it on. <laughs> Yellow means eh, maybe. 
I guess that means you could change the green real fast if you like the person headed your way. I'm not sure how that yellow one worked, but red men, I'm, I'm, I'm uneasy, and so I'd, I'd prefer more social distancing. Well, I appreciate a church caring about each other that way. I, I, I'm okay with that. How, how long has it been since you cared? How, here's unity. Here's unity in the text. We're to, we're not to please ourselves, but our neighbor. Verse 2 says, for his good to edification. I'm to build up my neighbor. I'm to edify him. I'm to strengthen him. I'm to encourage him. And in verse 6, that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How in the world, how in the world can you glorify God in this particular generation? Well, here's how. You can focus on your care for one another. You know, with me on the first thought here? There's a second thought in the passage, and, and here it is. We, we can glorify God by focusing on God's character. Not just our care for each other, but God's character. Did you, did you find those verses intriguing? Like, for instance, verse 5 right here. Now the God of patience and consolation. The God of patience and consolation. The God who is steadfast and the God who exhorts. Consolation means exhortation. The God, the God who's steadfast. You can trust him. The world may seem to be falling apart, but our God is still on the throne of the universe. I can glorify God for who He is, His character. Don't get so focused on a White House or a Congress that you miss the fact that God is still on the throne of the universe. He still rules. He still reigns. He, he still loves. He still gives. He still serves. He, he's a good God. He's a God of patience and consolation. Glorify His character. Focus on His character. When you get down here later in verse 13, the God of hope. I like that word. Hope is confidence, anticipation, expectation. Uh, one commentator said it is joyful and confident expectation of our eternal salvation. The God of all hope. I am secure in Jesus Christ tonight. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. I'm clean. I'm, I, I'm on my way to heaven. And it's as certain as if I'm already there. He's the God of hope. Put your trust in him and love him and focus on him. I, um, I, I, I don't mind a little politics here and there. But boy... You want to get discouraged? Watch the news. I read somewhere that the five leading causes of depression in the United States are NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, and FOX. And although we joke about it, there is some truth to it. It's easy to get discouraged in the hour in which we live. But our, our hope, our hope, our hope, our hope is in God. He's God. He's God. He's God. He's good. He's, he's wonderful. He's the God of hope. And don't you love verse 33? He gives us three glimpses of God's character in the 15th chapter. The God of, of patience and consolation. The God of hope. And the God of peace. Now I could park on this one a long time. We're a generation without peace. Our young people don't have peace. Just a few days ago, just a few days ago, I was out with a friend and he got a phone call and we cut short an event to drive to a parking lot where a girl we both knew had just overdosed. Had she not at the last moment texted a nurse friend of mine, actually a member of my home church, had she not texted a nurse from my home church and said, I did something really stupid. It took a few moments to find her. They didn't know where she was. And finally someone said, I think she went. And sure enough, she was in a parking lot next door to that location. And by the time we got there, she had passed out. It could have been very threatening. We rejoice and praise God that Tonight, she's alive. And praise God for that. We're in a world of no peace. Our hearts are troubled. Two of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing. 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding. How long has it been since your heart was just full of peace? He's the God of peace. The God of peace. The God of peace be with you all. God doesn't want our lives so troubled. How do we glorify God in this hour in which we live? Well, we got to care for one another. That's unity. That's love. That's encouragement. That's edification. But we got to focus on God's character. We got to get our eyes off of the world and get our eyes back into the book and remind ourselves who our God is. We got to remember that he wants us to have peace. He offers us peace. Get on your knees and pray. Stop the worry. Pray. Bring your request, he says. Make your request known. And the God of peace will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Is your heart overwhelmed with peace tonight? Peace, peace sounds like this. <sighs> All's well. All's well. All is well. It's that sigh of satisfaction. All is well. You've heard that sound after a good meal, haven't you? Because there's peace. My goodness, church, we live in an hour of no peace. Hearts are troubled and homes are struggling and we're frantic with worry. I, I'm not belittling anything. I'm just saying God wants you to have peace. That's his character. He's the God of peace. I'm saying to you tonight, I'm saying to you tonight that God invites us in this passage to glorify him in this hour in which we live. The Gentiles, praise God, that's us, might glorify God for his mercy. How do you glorify God? Well, first of all, by your care one for another. Secondly, by focusing on God's character. And thirdly, by focusing on our conduct in this text. We're to glorify God in the passage, and he just lays out and tells us how to do it. Right here, as practical as you want to be. Look in verse 9 again. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. You know how, you know how to glorify God? You know what the conduct ought to be in our lives? We ought to sing. That ought to be natural and normal. We ought to be a singing people. I got convicted about convicted about something recently. Has that ever happened to you? Or are you a better Christian than I am? I got convicted about something recently. I was reading in my Bible, and I was reading in the New Testament. In fact, I'm going to turn over there and read it to you just to make sure I read it accurately. Have you read this verse lately? Listen to this. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How many of y'all know that verse? You know that verse? You know what I got convicted about? Sometimes I use this verse to develop my music standards. I believe in music standards. But I got convicted about the fact that I use this verse to develop my music standards instead of obeying this verse. I, I got to where I could list all, you know, here's the reason you ought to not listen to this, and you ought to listen to that, and your music ought to sound like this, and this is what's right, and this is what's wrong. Amen, praise God, I'm independent Baptist. And I am. And I believe in standards. But I got convicted about this. Because the verse here isn't saying, use this verse to build standards. This verse is saying, you know what you ought to do? You ought to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and you ought to do some singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's like I got convicted about that. You know how to glorify God? Sing. You know how to glorify God? Sing. That's what he said. Glorify God, Gentiles. God's sure been merciful to you. Let it be known by your singing. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. 
down in my heart I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. You got the idea, don't you? You ought to sing. You have a song in your heart. The world around us is falling apart. I was on an airplane some years ago. I got up early, 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 early. It was early. And I got my luggage and I got dressed and I drove in the air to the airport in the darkness and I checked in in the darkness and I uh, got through security and I sat at my gate and, and nobody was talking and it was early. And I boarded the plane and I sat down and nobody was talking. It was early. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I heard somebody coming down the walkway whistling. They were whistling, come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitudes turned the water into wine. He just whistling away. And the guy got on like he'd been up for hours. <laughs> he just walked down the ice scene and everybody smiled and everybody. I'll tell you what I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew something about that man. That man's walking with God. How often are you and I like, oh my goodness, isn't the world falling apart? What in the world are we going to do come, come election? You know what we ought to be doing instead is we ought to, we ought to be singing. We ought to, we ought to, we ought to be lifting up our voice. We, we ought to, we ought to have some joy. Um, I've been singing lately a happy song. I feel like I need to get my heart happy. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk, makes the blind to see. Opens blinded eyes, with the captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. And I got this terrible habit. It's a blessing to my kids. I got this terrible habit. I sing one line. I got a river of life flowing out of me. And then I go back to reading. And later I start over. I got a river of life flowing out of me. I do that all the time. And I didn't know I did it until the other day when my son said, Dad, finish the song. Come on, you've sung that one line all day. He needed the joy of the Lord in his life. So I started over. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Here's what he's saying in the text. The Gentiles ought to glorify God by singing. You ought to get a song in your heart. Maybe you can't sing, hum. Maybe you can't hum, whistle. Maybe you can't whistle, tap your foot. That'll bless everybody in your house. Get some music, turn to get some joy in your heart. I was reading the other day in Psalm 51 where David is getting right with God. And I've, I, for years, I've used Psalm 51 in verse 10. I shared this with the guys at, at dinner tonight. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. I pray that verse every morning. Create in me a clean, I want a clean heart. I want to be the real deal. I want a, a right heart. I want to serve God with a pure heart and a clean heart all the days. I pray about it. I, I, I want to be right with God. Have you ever thought about that second part of that verse? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I got to get my spirit back in line. I, I, I get down. I get discouraged. I get frustrated. I get irritated. I get defeated. I get depressed. What do I got to do in this messed up world? I got to sing. You got to get your heart back in line. You got you to gotta add music to your life, the joy of the Lord to your life. He says here, let the Gentiles sing in verse uh, verse 9 here. He, he's pointing that out. They should sing unto thy name. Uh, you, you don't always have to sing a children's song. There's a ton of songs you ought to sing. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. How long has it been since you had a song in your heart? That's glorifying to God. I, uh, I like this one. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. 
Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. God, God wants you to get a song in your heart tonight. Some, some singing back in your soul. Singing and making melody in your heart. You know the word heart, don't you? It's a difficult word to define. It's a broad word. It's an unusual word. We use it in many ways. We'll say, my goodness, that guy's hard-hearted. Or, man, she's so tender-hearted. My sister was that way. My sister cried about everything. She'd drive over a skunk and cry about it. You're like, oh my goodness, you know, I killed this guy. Oh my goodness. You know that word heart. We Southerners, I'm from Tennessee, we say things like, bless your heart. You can, you can, you can say anything you want as long as you add that to it. You can say that baby's so ugly, bless its heart. And Southerners think that makes it okay. Oh, it's okay if you just add that to it. But that word heart is a word that talks about your thoughts your emotions, and your decisions. It's the sum total of your thoughts, your emotions, your decisions. I'm to sing and make melody in my heart. My thoughts should be full of singing unto the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My thoughts should be full of music. My emotions should be filled with music. There's nothing necessarily spiritual about being discouraged. Solemn, somber, frustrated, irritated, bothered. Are there times when we're sober? Sure. Is there a time for weeping? You better believe it. But the Bible is very clear here that one of the ways we glorify God, we glorify God as the Gentiles by our singing. Our conduct should be, be singing. That's our conduct. Sing unto the Lord. I got to close. You could say amen right there. He gives three others. Verse 9, he says, here's how you glorify God through the Gentiles' conduct. You sing. It's time to sing. In verse 10, he says, it's time to rejoice. To rejoice. To be delighted with a thing. Is your heart delighted with anything? How many of you, how many of you are delighted that you have a Bible? It's delighted. I have a Bible. Is your heart delighted? Rejoice! I'm, I got the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. It's the Word of God. You delighted in it. It means to, to show delight in a thing. Are you delighted in Jesus? That's my Savior. Man, is He good. He's washed away all my sins. He, uh, He's given me new life. I, I preached recently through Romans chapter 6 at camp. I did a three-part and four-part series in Romans 6. And I discovered in Romans 6 that Paul says, you know what you ought to do every day? You report dead on arrival. You get up and say, I am dead. I'm dead. I'll tell you what, when you're dead, not much bothers you. <laughs> Somebody can cut you off in traffic, but I'm dead. Doesn't bother me a bit. Pull out in front of me, doesn't bother me a bit. Irritate me, doesn't bother me a bit. Criticize me, doesn't bother me a bit. Disagree with me, doesn't bother me. I'm dead. He says in Romans 6, I'm to be dead. I, I get up every day and say, God, I'm, I'm dead. I report DOA. I'm dead on arrival. And then I rely all day long on the life of Jesus Christ. I can't, but he can. Jesus Christ can turn your I can'ts into, uh, into I can's. He, he can, he can turn your discouragements into blessings and, and he can take all the frustrations of your life and turn them into joys. God is able to do that. You ought to delight in a God like that. You ought to have some joy in your heart. There ought to be some, 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 some rejoicing in your life. You got a Bible. You got a God that answers prayer. You're forgiven of your sins. You're on your way to heaven. How do you glorify God? You focus on your care for others. You focus on God's character. And in Romans 15, you focus on our conduct. 
We ought to sing. It's time to sing, he says. It's time to rejoice. That's how you glorify God. Look at it in verse 11. It's time to praise. It's time to praise, to extol, to honor. That word praise, I like this definition I looked up, means to recommend. To praise is to recommend. When I, when I recommend Jesus to a sinner who doesn't know him, I'm praising him. So let me tell you about a Savior that changed my life. What am I doing? I'm praising Jesus. I, I was on the road to hell, and somebody told me about Jesus, and I met a Savior that can wash away all of your sins and come into your life and give you eternal life and turn your world right side up and change your life in ways that you would not even believe possible. And I recommend Him. I'm praising Him when I recommend Him to others. How long has it been since you recommended Jesus to somebody? You recommend Him to your wife lately? I've been studying some in Job. And Job's wife, in her grief, she's just lost ten children and all of her wealth. And her husband is, is not well now. And she says, hey, why don't you just curse God and die? And, and he, he recommends God to her. Don't speak like a foolish woman, he says. Hasn't God been good, good to us when he gave us everything? And isn't God still good? He says earlier, naked came out of my mother's womb and naked will I return thither. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What's he doing? He's recommending God. You know what I believe with all my heart? It's time that we as a church stop, stop sitting around wringing our hands. And it's time that we as a church get our hearts into a happy state of mind and march out into this dark world and this discouraged world and this frustrated world and make a difference for the cause of Christ. We got to glorify God, church. We've got we've to get our conduct in order so we can glorify. It's time to sing. It's time to rejoice. It's time to praise. And did you catch the last one? It's in verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles, what? Trust. It's time to sing. That's glorifying to God. It's time to rejoice. That's glorifying to God. It's time to praise. That's glorifying to God. And I say to you, it's time to trust. It's time to trust God. It's time to trust God, church. It's time to trust God. Is our world a mess, yes or no? Are there tons of uncertainties, yes or no? But you know what Gentiles are supposed to do? We're to glorify God by trusting Him. We're to glorify God by trusting Him. I, I, I don't know how this song goes exactly, but I heard a song years ago. Everything's all right in my Father's house. In my Father's house, in my Father's house, everything's all right in my Father's house. Where there's joy, joy, joy. Do you trust God that much? you trust God? Life can be hard, can it? Sitting today in a living room, talking with my wife, and her sister, and my brother-in-law, and my mom-in-law. Is this cancer going to take her life? Probably. Could God do a miracle? He could. But the way life is in a sin-cursed world, death is inevitable. This will probably take her life. It's a different ballgame to sit in a living room today and say, Mom, we'll trust God through this, right? And trust God in this dark hour. Can we scare you with heaven? Will we miss her? Sure. She's my mother-in-law, but I like her. <laughs> She's been one of my big cheerleaders. We joke a lot. She jokes and I joke. She was the church secretary for years, and every time I'd hear a new mother-in-law joke, I'd go to the office and tell it to her <laughs> because I knew she would react, and she always does. She would throw pencils and staplers and, and <laughs> computer screens at me as I was fleeing down the hallway. We've, we've been good friends for years. I don't know what's going on in your life tonight, but you can trust God. 
And the way you glorify God in the darkest hours of your life is you trust God. How do you, how do you glorify God in the wonderful hours of your life? You trust God. As I've been studying Job, I've been amazed. I focused so long on the fact that Job, when he lost everything, trusted God and, 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 and just, just honored God as best he knew how in the loss of everything. I, I realized the other day that he trusted God long before he lost everything. When he had everything, he trusted God. He was better than most of us in our generation. So we have this tendency in the United States of America when all is well to forget God. We're not as fervent when all is well. Our prayer lives aren't as fervent. We're, we can become complacent and, and lacking a bit when all is well, but not Job. You read the first five verses, you'll find out when all was well and he was the wealthiest and greatest man in the East, he raised a godly family. They were close and happy and loved the Lord, and he prayed for them every day and made altar and sacrifice, and even when they were grown, called them to prayer meetings. You can read that in the first five verses of the first chapter. He was an incredible man, but the whole sum of his life is that he trusted God. At the end of his life, God says to his three friends, what you said about me was not right. Now, my servant Job said about me things that were right. What you said was not right. My servant Job... Now, he said things about me that were right. In fact, I'm not going to forgive you unless your friend Job is willing to pray for you. I always find that interesting. That's one of those things I scratch my head and go, have no idea what's going on there. How would you like that? How would you like? God said, I'm not going to forgive you unless so-and-so prays for you. Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? It's what happened in Job's friends' lives. I don't understand all that. Don't claim to. And, and yet I like the story because it's about trusting God. And I'm closing my message tonight. Church, church God has called us to glorify Him. In the darkness of this hour, in the frustrations of this hour, in the discouragement of this hour, it is imperative that you and I glorify God in a greater way than we ever have. And if we're going to glorify God, we've got to care about one another. Paul makes that very clear here in Romans chapter 15. And if we're going to glorify God, we've got to get focused on God's character. He is the God of patience and consolation and the God of hope and the God of all peace. And if we're going to glorify God, we've got to, get our, got to get our conduct in order. It's time to sing and it's time to rejoice and it's time to praise God and it's time to trust Him with all of our heart and, and with all of our life and with all of our being. And I close my message tonight by asking you, based on this word trust, is there anybody in this service tonight and you don't know our God? You know about Him. You've heard of Him. But you've never trusted in the Savior Jesus Christ to wash away your sins and to give to you everlasting life. And if you've never trusted in Him, that's the word that begins a relationship with God. It's the word trust. It's the word faith. It's the word believe. And the Bible's so simple about it, my dear friend. The Bible's so simple about the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and was raised from the dead. Because he died, forgiveness of sins is available. Because he was raised from the dead, eternal life is available. And beyond that, spiritual life, everlasting life, and abundant life on top of that. It's all based on the death of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. And the only thing you have to have in your life to get to know him is trust. You've got to come to him and say, God, I don't know you, and I am a sinner, and I know I don't deserve to know you, and if I got what I deserved, I'd actually, I'd be under your judgment and I'd have to go to hell. But I want that Jesus to take away my sins and give me eternal life. You just trust him. You just trust him. You just trust him. You trust his death. He'll wash away your sins. You trust in his resurrection, and he'll give you eternal life. It is that simple, isn't it, church? And if you don't know Christ tonight, it's, it's Tuesday night, and it'd be a good night for you to meet Jesus Christ as your Savior. Have I made sense tonight? Glorify God in this messed up hour, and it'll make a difference. Let's stand together for prayer. Everyone standing, every... When standing, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And how many of you in the building tonight would say, Brother Young, God spoke to me not tonight about glorifying Him and my care for others. I guess I have been so focused on myself and, and, and so down right now and, uh, and somewhat frustrated with all the issues going on that I have kind of forgotten to care for those around me and 
to pray with them and for them and encourage them and edify them. Pray with me, Brother Dave. I want to glorify God in my care for others. God spoke to me about that. Lift your hand good and high, would you, tonight?